<clears throat> well, as you can see, this is the point in our service where the children are dismissed and they head off to the classrooms that are prepared for them. And so hopefully if you're new with us and someone was able to tell you that, so this isn't a surprise, but uh, they're more than welcome to stay with you. That's fine too, but um, that's where they're all going. It's not a rebellion. Um, it was planned. The rest of us, I would encourage you to open up a Bible to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, um, we're going to continue on in our study of this glorious book. Uh, church historians have said that Matthew's gospel is, has been one of the most, if not the most, influential book throughout church history in the church. I don't know how they quantify that, but... Um, but I, I tend to agree. Obviously, books like Romans have been hugely influential, and other books, all of them have their place for sure. But Matthew's gospel is so vitally important. It's important to remember that Matthew is uh, telling a story. He's not making up a story. He's telling it. He's giving us eyewitness account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. He himself, Matthew was a disciple, became a disciple of Jesus during that Galilean ministry. And so Matthew was with Jesus. He heard these things, he saw these things, and he's writing them down for our benefit. Uh, Matthew's not just sitting alone in a desk and thinking, what do I remember? And just making up kind of, not making up, but just writing down random memories from the life of Jesus. It's very clear and very apparent that he has a methodical Point. He is making a point throughout his gospel. He is trying to lead us as his readers to a certain persuasion. He's trying to persuade us to think certain things, which is what all good teachers do. By the way, all bad teachers do that too. All false teachers are trying to persuade you of something. And effective teachers can do that. Matthew is making the point that Jesus is coming on the scene, and he is Israel's Messiah. He is God's chosen king. And he's made that point emphatically throughout this gospel. Uh, but he's also made the point that Israel as a nation did not believe that. Specifically, the religious leadership, the establishment in the day, did not receive Jesus as their king. He was presented to them as such, but he was rejected. He was rejected as the king. Throughout Matthew's gospel, there are certain things that kind of rise to the surface that we can cues and things that we can pick up on. For example, throughout Jesus' ministry, there, there seem to be three prominent groups of people that are always there. They're always kind of in the, the mass of people that Jesus is ministering to. First off, there are the disciples. They're maybe even the most obvious group. Those who Jesus called to follow him, they, they left everything, they followed Jesus. They were his learners, his disciples. They were, they were listening to him, they were watching him, they were eating with him, they were doing ministry with him. And all the while, though they didn't probably realize it, they were becoming more like him themselves. A disciple is a learner. Someone who has devoted their life to learning from someone else. And that's exactly what the disciples are doing. Uh, it won't be too long, a couple chapters from now, when uh, one of the disciples will completely abandon Jesus and show himself to not really be a disciple after all. But he's blending in. For the most part, the disciples were those who were obedient, at least seeking to be obedient to Jesus' expectations albeit ever so imperfectly. The other group of people that we find in Matthew's gospel are the religious establishment, the religious leaders of the day, the, the elite, so to speak, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, those who make up the, the leadership structure of Israel. They were the learned. They were the ones who were the experts in the law of Moses, self-designated, by the way. They were the ones who had given their lives to study and to proclaim what Moses had written. And they 
wholeheartedly do not like Jesus. It seems like they quasi gave him a chance, maybe at the beginning. They were curious what he was talking about, what he was doing. They had heard rumors probably or saw evidence themselves that he was doing miracles. That'll pique someone's interest, if nothing else. But some of the things that Jesus did and said really, really bothered them. And they could not allow themselves to believe in him as the Messiah, the chosen one of God. So there's this group, the the hard-hearted, stiff-necked, hypocritical religious leaders. They stand opposed to Jesus. So on one end of the uh, spectrum, you have these hard-hearted religious leaders. On the other side of the spectrum, you have the tender-hearted disciples who are trying to learn from Jesus and follow Jesus. But in the middle, you have this mass of people just referred to as the crowds. It shows up a lot throughout Matthew's gospel, that word, the crowds. And it's always referring to not always the same people, but always the same types of people. I think even in this, there's a lesson. Because even today, we could say, in any given group, there are those who are going for it with Jesus, who have cast their lot in with Jesus, and they've said, I'm in no matter what. Life, death, blessing, cursing, I'm going to follow Christ until my dying day. They've believed on the Lord Jesus. They're seeking to, uh, to incorporate his teaching into their lives. And in any given crowd, there are probably the hard-hearted, hypocritical. They might not manifest that outwardly because especially if they're outnumbered, they don't typically do that. But you get them in a group and, and you'll soon begin to realize their true colors. They don't like Jesus. They don't like what he stands for. They don't like what he teaches or how he lives. They don't like the expectations that he puts on people's lives. But then you have this massive group in between. The crowds. The undecided. Those who have not yet made up their minds on who Jesus is. On one end of the spectrum, you have those that are in the crowd that are maybe enamored by what Jesus says. They like the ministry of Jesus. They're drawn to it themselves. They like the benefits of Jesus. But they've never really made a decision to follow Christ. For them, they're still undecided. And in this last chapter of discourse given to the people of Israel collectively, we find all three of these groups. Jesus is in the temple. It's the final days of his life. Just a couple days earlier, this crowd, the crowds, were there ushering Jesus into Israel and into the temple with cries of Hosanna, son of David, Hosanna in the highest. The crowd crowds were starting to be convinced, maybe because of the miracle that Jesus had just done days previous by raising Lazarus from the dead just a few miles away from Jerusalem. But there is a collective uh, like anticipation that maybe Jesus is actually the Messiah. And the crowds bring him into Jerusalem with shouts and chants and all kinds of fanfare. He comes into Jerusalem He takes a look around the temple and he goes out of Jerusalem. And the next day he comes in with a cat of nine tails with a whip and he cleans out the temple. Maybe the expectation of the crowd was that he would go to the Romans and clean them out. Because after all, the, the Jews thought their greatest threat was their enemies that they could see. But Jesus knew their greatest threat was the sin that lurked in their hearts that kept them from a right relationship with God. And Jesus knew the plan was not to expel the Romans, but to die on a Roman cross. So Jesus goes on with the plan of God. He he disrupts the temple worship. He exposes the hypocritical lies of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He exposes them in their hypocrisy through a a series of parables. And then there's a little Q&A session. And we've just... Uh, finished up this time at the end of chapter 22 where Jesus is asked a series of questions, three to be precise. The Pharisees and Sadducees have in their mind the intent to trip him up, to confuse him, to get him to stumble over his words, to get him to say something that the crowds won't like, 
to turn the people against him, to turn the Romans against him, anything just to, to get this guy off of his A-game. Jesus comes out unscathed, and then he asks them a question, leaves them completely confounded and humiliated and speechless. And the final thing that Jesus says before he leaves the temple He's going to spend another day with his disciples, and then he's going to go and die. The final thing that he says to to the collective people of Israel is found in in Matthew chapter 23. It's a significant chapter. It's one that uh, doesn't show up, at least not nearly to this extent, in the other Gospels. And specifically, he addresses the crowds, he addresses his disciples, And he addresses the religious establishment of the day. This morning, my intent was to cover the first two, the crowds and the disciples, and spend next week addressing what Jesus says to the religious leaders. But I only got through one point in the first hour, so now I have to figure out how to say the same thing again. Because we're only going to cover point number one this morning. Jesus has one final opportunity to address Israel as a nation, to address these groups of people, and he gives them a word. He says a lot of different words, right? But you can sum it up, I believe, in one word or one word of exhortation. And so, let's look at it together, starting in chapter, one, or chapter 23, verse 1, and I'll read down through verse 12. But we're just going to cover the first seven verses. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue, and greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ." The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Again, my intention was to cover that whole section this morning. I failed miserably, but we'll come back to it next week if the Lord tarries. So, the first section, the first point, you'll see there in the notes, a word for the listeners. And in this sense, the disciples are part of that crowd because those who listened were those who were hearing the instruction of the Pharisees, those who were hearing the instruction of the scribes. And the disciples obviously would have heard some of that as well. But Jesus has a word specifically, I think, to the crowds, to those of us who hear things. And in thinking about this passage, I was reminded that this season is Reformation season, at least in my own heart, because in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg Castle door, and in a sense declared spiritual war, although I don't think that's what he was intending to do, against the Roman Catholic Church. He had some problems with what was being taught and some of the practices that were being practiced within the Roman Catholic Church. And what happened as a result of that was a firestorm of controversy. The people got a hold of those 95 theses and they took it and they used a very unspiritual piece of invention, the printing press. And they used the printing press to make mass copies of Martin Luther's declaration. And through that, the people had copies all across the land, and they could read for themselves the problems, the, the, the errors that were a part of the Roman Catholic Church, and it united the people. 
It united the people. It created a division that was very much necessary and helpful in the church because the Roman Catholic Church was teaching all kinds of heretical things. They had lost their way and they needed to be corrected. But that, that unspiritual thing, so obviously the Reformation is a spiritual movement. It's, a, it's an awakening of God. It's a, a revival of sorts that has not been seen probably before or after where Christianity was revived. It was on the brink of death and it revived and came back to life. But what did God use? God used the invention of the printing press. And it's hard to even quantify how strategic that was. That God would use the printing press and that that the printing press made available thoughts and ideas that otherwise wouldn't have been available to the common man, to the average person. Historians tell us that the printing press and the invention of the printing press is, is uh, beyond just the Reformation, is uh, a major shift in humanity. Where it took ideas and um, opinions and thoughts and made them widely available. And probably, I was thinking about this this morning, probably it's, it's paled in comparison to the invention of the internet. Whereas Martin Luther could write out his ideas and they could take it and, and make uh, copies, so to speak. They could print copies of that by the hundreds, maybe thousands, and spread them out as far as they could over time by horseback and other means. Now, with the internet, you can say whatever you want, and someone on the other side of the world can hear it instantaneously. The internet has made it possible for anyone and everyone to have an audience globally, which we could say, well, that's great. But you know who else says that's great? Satan. And this morning, I became very burdened, actually, during the first service, sitting here singing, and I just became burdened. My heart sank for a minute, and I became, uh, I don't know what the right word is other than burdened, discouraged, because I started to realize my voice is so insignificant when, you, when it's drowned out by the voices of the world. And the desire that God has put in my heart is to present a people before God that are blameless and without reproach, a people that love Christ with all their hearts. And in a moment, I was sitting here on the front row and thinking, what can my little insignificant voice do in a sea of voices? Even now, you could all access 10,000 other teachers while I'm talking. You go out from here and you hear probably 10,000 other voices saying all kinds of different information to where it's literally impossible for me to even know what influences are in your life. It's impossible for me to even know what type of thinking is coming into your mind throughout the week and how do I need to combat that to, to help you walk with Christ. And when I for a moment started to think about all that, I literally felt like I was sinking. Sinking in a sea of of just ideas and thoughts and opinions. And in my unbelief, I, I realized, what is my small voice? It's nothing. But in the providence of God, he allowed me to experience that and then he revived my heart in a moment by reminding me that God's word is powerful, amen? Amen. And that what I cannot do with my insignificant voice, God can do and will do and has done and is doing. He will build his church. He will build his church against the threats of all the enemies of hell. Every voice that comes against the thoughts of God will be silenced. Every false teaching, whether... Uh, abhorrent or whether just slightly off will be exposed. 
and he will use my little insignificant voice and he'll use 10,000 other little insignificant voices all to build his church into the people that he wants them to be. That's a big thought to have in the last song. It kind of crushed me and revived me all at once, which is probably why I didn't finish my message. It was the Lord's fault. Uh, But here we go. In this passage, Jesus will confront the crowds. He'll give them a word. He'll give them a, an exhortation. He'll, he'll confront the disciples and give them a word of exhortation. But he also gives a lengthy rebuke to these false teachers, the false leaders that were in Israel at the time. And we'll get to that in time. But first, I just want to focus on what Jesus says to the crowds. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, this is significant, I think it's helpful for us to realize that Jesus is speaking to the crowds as well as to his disciples. In other places, like in Matthew chapter 5, where we, we come to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to his disciples in the hearing of a large crowd. But the intention that Matthew wants us to pick up on is these words are intended for the disciples in the hearing of the crowd. The crowd will benefit from hearing them if they put them in practice. But the intention of Jesus in that teaching is to instruct his disciples. Here, he's specifically instructing the crowds as well as the disciples. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. That's an interesting and curious way of saying it. Moses obviously was the great teacher in Israel. He was the man whom God chose to reveal himself to and ultimately to reveal, uh, God revealed himself through Moses to the nation of Israel. He was the lawgiver. Uh, He is kind of the quintessential Israelite, you could say. It's who they look to. They drew instruction from the law of Moses, from the scriptures. And so all of that came back to Moses. And what Jesus is saying here is this. The scribes and the Pharisees, this group of stiff-necked, hard-hearted individuals, have assumed the seat of Moses. Now, Moses wasn't around. He's been gone for 1,500 years at this point. But the point Jesus is making is this. Moses, uh, anyone who who begins to teach the words of Moses and to tell people this is what Moses meant by these words is standing in that position of authority, is sitting on that seat of authority. And the scribes and the Pharisees had taken it upon themselves over time, to designate themselves as the teachers in Israel. And by the time Jesus comes on the scene, by the time Jesus begins to teach and preach and heal, the Pharisees and the scribes were the known teachers in Israel. They were the established ones in the land. Where if if you and your family were a good Jewish family, you would go to synagogue on the Sabbath nearby. You would go to the synagogue, and there at the synagogue, you would hear the, the, the scriptures read publicly. And then someone would assume a seat, and they would begin to instruct the people on what those scriptures meant. It was often the scribes and the Pharisees. Those who were self-declared experts in the law. And because the average person was out farming all day, and because the average person had to do duties at home, they didn't have the luxury of studying all day, devoting themselves to these things. They just believed them. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat this is an unofficial seat, so to speak. It's not even a real seat. It's just a, a, a theoretical seat. And Jesus is speaking of an office, of a position of authority. The office of teacher, the one who instructs others. 
and specifically in this case instructs them in the word of God. Verse 3 tells us, as again he's speaking to the crowds here, so do and observe whatever they tell you. This is so interesting to me, and I remember uh, over the years reading that and thinking, that, is, that doesn't make sense. I mean, Jesus has made it a point several times to denounce the scribes and the Pharisees, to expose them for being hypocrites and false these, these disciples, or I'm sorry, these Pharisees and scribes were the very ones who were telling the people that Jesus is not the Christ. They hate Jesus. But Jesus says to them, so do and observe whatever they tell you. This was hard for me at first because when I came to Christ as, as a 18 year old kid, I was in an environment where there were Christians around me, but they were Christians who had been uh, deeply wounded by other people in churches long before me. They had been deeply wounded by the, the experiences that they had had in certain churches and by certain people. And that affected their version of Christianity, that, that infected, I should say, their thoughts about the Bible and about spiritual leadership and about church in general. So I was kind of subtly being instructed to, to not believe anybody, to be suspect of anybody who stands up and says they were going to teach you the Bible, especially in a church. Religious leaders, Christians, pastors, elders, those people are to be especially suspect. And it really started to, I didn't realize it at the time, but it really started to uh, affect my thinking. I noticed it when I, I started to feel God's call on my life to go into that very role. And it scared me. And I tried to run from it. Because I thought, surely I don't want to be one of them. Well, God runs faster, in case you're wondering. And he chased me down, but... That's not the point. What I want to say is this. Even in our day, there are countless numbers of people, maybe some of you here in this audience, and maybe definitely some of your family and friends and people that you interact with, who have been deeply hurt by people in the church. They've been deeply hurt by churches and how they function or how they uh, misfunction. And because of these bad experiences, they're turned away from the gospel, they're turned away from the things of God, and they're turned away from church in particular. Well, think about who Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to the crowds who've been raised under the system of the Pharisees. Talk about damaging. He's talking to a people who have only known, they haven't had a prophet in over 400 years until John came along, these people have been raised on the ideas that you have to work your way to heaven. They have been raised under the burden system that you have to earn favor from God through your good works. And the very culprits doing the teaching are the scribes and the Pharisees. And Jesus says they're sitting in the seat of Moses. They're in that office. So you need to listen to them. You need to do and observe. Literally two commands here. Do and observe. You need to put into practice and keep practicing whatever they tell you. The point I'm trying to make is this. I'm, I'm shocked a little bit. And I think some people wrongly say that Jesus was an insurrectionist, that Jesus had a new way of doing it, that Jesus was coming to rebel against the Pharisees and the scribes and to cast off the yoke of Judaism. But rather, where do you often see Jesus preaching and teaching? In the synagogue. Jesus came into the system that was broken and he shined a light so that it would be exposed and so that others would know the way. He didn't throw it away. He didn't cast it off. He didn't say, let's do something else. 
I'm so irritated, honestly, in my heart when I hear of, of these young whippersnappers. I can say that now because I'm 40. These young bucks, these young guys that have all the great ideas and have all the, the resources and they go out and start something new because the old fuddy-duddies at their church won't let them do the cool things. They can't work with people so they just say, forget about it, we'll do our own thing. Now I'm not saying in every situation that's always bad because sometimes the Lord does lead people to do that. But I think if you were to take a spiritual pull, if God were to pull back the curtain and show you what was really going on, you would see a lot of churches with no lampstand. A lot of churches that God doesn't look upon as a church. A lot of people doing their own ideas, very ingenuitive, very entrepreneurial, but void of the Spirit. And they can make things look successful for a season, But in the end, they all come crashing down. They assume a role that God has not given them. The scribes and the Pharisees could be classified as false teachers. And they should be classified as false teachers. But Jesus, if you'll notice here, when we get to the point here, Jesus doesn't call them false teachers because of what they're saying, but what they're doing. Now, clearly they said some wrong things, and Jesus exposed those things. Uh, they, they didn't accept him as the Messiah. That would be chief among their false teaching, that Jesus isn't the Christ. But that's not Jesus' chief concern with the scribes and the Pharisees. What he says to the crowds is simply this. They sit on the seat of Moses. They're teaching you the law of Moses, so obey them, but not the works they do. Do what they tell you, but not what they're doing. Don't model your life after them, but listen to their instruction because ultimately you need to build your life on the words of Moses. Jesus gives a summary statement here before he goes into a lengthy description of these scribes and Pharisees. For they preach, but do not practice. If you were to list out false teachers, you could, give, you could start with two categories. There are false teachers who say the wrong things. But then there are false teachers who say a lot of right things, but live wrongly. The Bible would classify both groups as false teachers. Sometimes false teaching is obvious, right? If someone comes along knocking at your door and says, Jesus isn't God, You're like, have a good day. I don't believe that. But sometimes false teaching can be very subtle and deceptive. Sometimes they come saying all the right things. And it's not until later when you find out about their life that you realize they were never sent from God. This is the burden I felt this morning, trying with a a puny voice to to declare the the excellencies of God, trying with a, a small voice in a small platform to say, don't follow after false teaching, knowing full well it it's dominating your landscape. It's in the Christian radio, it's it's all over the internet. This morning, out of curiosity, I did a Google search for Bible teaching. I just literally typed in the words Bible teaching. Got over six million hits. I perused all of them and realized, no, I'm just kidding. That's just it. You can't, right? There's so many options. You can't even begin to scratch the surface. But with six million hits, and that's just with those two words, you could count a lot of different other expressions and add it all up. There is teaching everywhere, and most of it is wrong. Most of it is wrong. Satan in the garden, that wily, cunning, crafty serpent, came to the woman just asking questions initially. I mean, he's just a curious snake. Can't fault him. 
He's asking questions, and he asks some questions of the woman, and ultimately, subtly, his intention was to turn her heart away from God, to turn her affections away from the God who made her. And that's exactly what he does. In the course of a short conversation, he turns her whole world upside down. He asks a couple innocent questions, so seemingly, and then he makes a couple assertions, propositional statements, and all at once, Eve takes of the fruit and eats some, and everything changes. Now her husband wasn't very helpful. He was there and heard everything and didn't do anything. But the point is, Satan has been a liar from the beginning, Jesus says. His intention from the beginning is to ruin, distort, pervert, twist what God has made good. And whereas God uses things like the printing press to promote a a global revival in Christianity, Satan comes along and uses it for all kinds of evil as well. And then the internet is invented by Al Gore. That's a joke. I don't think he really did. But he tells us so, so. The internet comes along. And now you take the printing press and you you literally just multiply it by a billion. Now ideas are everywhere. There's some good teaching out there and there's a lot of bad teaching. Here's Here's the subtlety of the internet. Jesus says here, they preach but do not practice. In other places, he says, you'll know them by their fruit, and we'll look at those in a minute. But the, the Pharisees and the scribes, as wrong as they were, they still lived among the people. They interacted with them in the marketplaces. They saw them in the synagogues. They would have been neighbors and, and family friends of theirs. They would have known their life. They would have been able to, to put the pieces together. Wait a minute, on, on Saturday he said this, but, but on Monday he did that. With the internet... All you see is a pretty face and a polished message and you have no idea what their lives are like. Now sometimes in the providence of God, uh, something comes along to expose them and they come crashing down as a charlatan. But how many other cases will we not know till we get there? That these people are subtly saying deceptive and wrong ideas You don't know what their lives are like because you have no access to them. That's the danger of the internet. Now, I'm not telling you don't ever listen to preaching on the internet. It can be very helpful. What I'm saying is you have to be careful. And that's what Jesus is essentially saying here. These these scoundrels sit on the seat of Moses, so do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do. What Jesus is saying in an exhortation is this. He's admonishing the crowds and anyone else who sits under teaching to be discerning. To be discerning. To make a distinction between right and wrong. To be able to have the wisdom and the the ability to think for yourself. To identify what is false and what is true. This is a need in the church today. Not just our church, but across the globe. The church is in such a weak, anemic state state right now because teaching abounds, but most of it is garbage. People are building their lives on shaky foundations. They're getting workers who cut corners, who get the job done quick, and they're cheap, But in the end, the storm will reveal the work was done poorly. What Jesus would say to the crowds then and to us now is this, you have to be discerning. Let me read you some scriptures. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says this, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Did you hear that? 
Paul would have a lot of things to say to false teachers, and he does. He calls them out regularly. But here, he's talking to the church, and he says, Church, you have a responsibility to see to it that no one takes you captive. Don't be led astray. That's a command to us who are hearing to hear carefully. Because ideas have the power to bind us up and to carry us off as slaves. And if you and I are not being discerning in the things that we're hearing, we will go off like sheep to the slaughter. We will be turned away from the God who made us. It calls for discernment. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Moses says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder... And the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. Whoa. Even if it's true, if he says, hey, this is going to happen in three weeks, and it happens according to what he says, if he then says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You should do it because his sign came true, right? No, no. Moses says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. Did you hear that? The Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. He has already given you truth. And if a man comes along saying a different truth, even if he backs it up with miracles, don't go after him. It's a test from the Lord. A lot of people fail in that test these days. Listening to all kinds of nonsense. Being espoused by all kinds of charlatans. Clowns. Ridiculous people called by their own will to serve a God they do not know. Listen to Matthew. Jesus has some things to say. He's already said these. Matthew 7, verse 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets. Be careful. Watch out. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. They come sounding sweet and sincere and loving and kind and like they just want to help you know God better. But Jesus says inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They seek to destroy you. They have the same nature as their father, the devil. You will know them by their fruits. Just as a little side note, first service didn't get this tidbit, but here you go. Peter and Jude give us a good description of what false prophets are like. Let me just summarize three areas where you will often find um, wrong fruit in a false teacher's life. It typically manifests, not always, but typically manifests in the area of sexuality. They can't control their lusts. Or in the area of pride, typically always starts there actually, pride in a lust for power and control, or in the area of greed, lust of the flesh, pride of the eyes, boastful pride of life, John says. You want to know whether someone's a false teacher? Is their life marked by sensuality? Do they have a a lust and a hunger for power and control? Do they always seem to be talking about money? You can never be satisfied with what God has given them. They always want a little bit more. Well, take note. Be a fruit inspector. Be cautious. They might be saying the right things in the moment, but be sure of this, their sins will find them out and God will expose them in due time. 
Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says this, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be, future tense, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. The New Testament is replete with warnings about false teaching and false prophets. People who come in their own sense of calling, they're driven by their own will, not the will of God. They come in their own authority, not the authority of Christ. And and a lot of times you can't tell on the surface whether or not what they're saying is valid or not valid. I know for me, especially early on in my Christian life, when my convictions were still being uh, formed and altered, there were times when I would hear something, and it's like, you know, something would just in, internally be like, ah, that doesn't sound right. That I couldn't, if someone asked me, I wouldn't be able to identify what was wrong with it, but there's just something about it, there's something about the situation, something is not right here. And I learned to trust that instinct And some of you need to learn to trust that instinct so that you don't take the poison that's being disseminated. It always comes in real fancy packaging, in very similar packaging to the real thing, but you drink it down and it has lasting effects on your thoughts about God. Be careful. Jesus says, be, be discerning, pay attention. Listen to how he describes these scribes and Pharisees. Verse four, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with a finger. The idea is this, in this world, if you, if you were going on a little journey, if you were going a few towns away, like the Passover, if you were making a pilgrimage to the Passover, you would take, not all your belongings, but whatever you needed for the trip, you would tie it up on a beast of burden like a donkey, and you would make your way on the journey. You're not going to carry all that stuff. That's why God made donkeys. And so you put it on the donkeys, and you make your way on the journey, and Jesus says these teachers are like that, and they make you the donkey. And they put these heavy burdens on you. And they make you feel all this guilt and things about things you shouldn't feel guilty about. And they they create a separation between you and your God. Because it makes them feel better about themselves. And all the while you begin to look to them as the experts. And before you know it, you need them. Before you know it, they are standing between you and God because of this heavy burden. But here's the thing. They're not willing to lift a finger. They're not even willing to take the smallest little bit off of that load for you. It's in sharp contrast to what Jesus said earlier in Matthew 11. My burden is light. Come to me. I'll give you rest. So these men don't have any intention of doing what they're teaching, but they're teaching things that burden the people. Verse 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. This is so common, even in our day. This is, this is the sinful heart of man, that we live for the approval of the people around us. And so when that mindset hasn't been put to death, we bring that into religion and we begin to work out salvation, so to speak, by doing the things that the people around us want us to do. And if these unconverted people find their way into leadership, they begin to carry out their leadership in ways that impress the people, but pay no attention to the God of heaven. Living for the approval of men. They make, they do all their deeds to be seen by others. They make their phylacteries uh, broad. These are Small boxes, leather pouches that would have been bound around the head and on the arms. And it's based on the principle that in the Old Testament, Moses says things like, bind God's word upon your mind. And they're like, oh, okay, I know what that means. It means we should make a little leather box and we should get little portions of scripture and we should tuck it away in the box and then put that on our heads. 
You laugh. <laughs> That's literally what they did. It's literally what they did. Maybe they were thinking that by osmosis it would seep in there somehow, but it didn't. And if the average person was expected to make a, you know, a, a, a one-inch phylactrophy for their head, then the Pharisees, who are more religious than everybody, are going to make a four-inch phylactrophy. I'm better than the average man, and I'll prove it. Look how big it is. I just imagine God laughing, scorning them. But anyway, we're moving on. So these phylacteries, these little boxes, these little pouches, or the fringes of their garments, they made them extra long. God uh, said through Moses that these, the men's um, adornment was to be a certain way. And at the ends of their robes, they would have had these little tassels. And don't ask me why. I don't know why. Don't really need to know why. God says do it, and they did it. But these guys who were really spiritual, mine's twice as long. And so you could know in a crowd when people are passing by, oh, that guy, he's a Pharisee. He's identifiable just by the external appearance. He would make it known to you. Verse 6, they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. This is that pride that manifests itself in false teachers. They love the privilege that comes with the position that they have. They love the privilege. They love to be able to look down on other people. They love it when other people prop them up. And so they always seem to find the best seat. They always seem to find the most austere place to sit. They love specific titles or specific greetings. Oh, bless you, Rabbi. Oh, yeah, good to see you too. Jesus is speaking of the internal pride that lurks in their heart, that goes unnoticed, but is noticeable through their behavior. You will know them by their fruits. And what he says to the crowds and to us today is this, you need to be discerning. You will go out from here today and many of you will access other teachings online throughout your week or just in subtle ways you'll hear it being said to you uh, between songs or during songs on Christian radio. You will hear all kinds of ideas pouring into your head and if you're not careful, if you have not taken the Bible and implemented it into your life in a way that teaches you to discern truth from error, then these lies will be infecting your mind throughout the week. We need to be discerning. We need to be careful who we're listening to. You need to be watchful for the lives of the people you're listening to. One of the benefits, one of the blessings of being a pastor, there's lots of benefits, lots of blessings, but one of them is this. I get to study and preach the word of God. It is a responsibility that I don't know how to explain it to you, the burden that I feel in my own soul that keeps me on the straight and narrow, that keeps me guarded over my own life without anything that you think of me. But the other blessing of being a pastor is this. I'm saying it to people I'm living with, I'm working with, I'm talking with, I'm hopefully in your lives and you're in my life. So there's an extra layer of accountability so that I don't become a Pharisee and a scribe and someone who's leading others astray. Sometimes error is very subtle. It's almost imperceptible. If you were to fly from Portland, take off in a plane, and fly to Japan, to Tokyo, Japan, if your plane is off just a half a degree in the wrong direction, if you follow that course long enough, you will be so off course by the time you reach your destination that it won't even be possible to land there. You'll end up in Siberia. And so it is with us. If 
we are not daily and, and hourly recalibrating our instruments to the word of God and being discerning of the things that we're hearing and the way that we're living, we will miss it. We'll miss it. Be discerning, church. Pay attention to what you're hearing and to who's speaking into your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we come before you um, just needing your help. We recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing, Jesus. We recognize that uh, our lives are filled with information, we are swimming in a sea of information all the time. And if we're not careful, that information, that wrong information gets into our lives and infects us and, and can drown us, Lord. Please keep us for yourself. Help us to love you. Help us to serve you. Help us to, to have an ear to hear you. I pray that you would guard and protect this church for your purposes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and uh, stand, if you will. I want to read a benediction, but I'm going to read a longer passage because it, it kind of ends with an exhortation that picks up where we just left off, and then it'll send us off with a blessing. This is from Jude. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Listen to this doxology. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.